The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. John the Baptist saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He is the one of whom I said, A man is coming after me who ranks ahead of me because he existed before me. I did not know him, but the reason why I came baptizing with water was that he might be made known to Israel. John testified further, saying, I saw the Spirit come down like a dove from heaven and remain upon him. I did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me on whomever you see the Spirit come down and remain, he is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. Now I have seen and testified that he is the Son of God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. One of the great principles of Norbertine formation life um, is a principle called gradual inclusion. And for many years, I've been many different places. And the last few weeks, Father Bob's been asking me to preach here and be present here. And so I've left Holy Rosary, and I'm here, and it's Isleta these days. And, um, and so this is kind of an evolution of my own inclusion and gradual inclusion. But I found that item and that way of being very consonant with Christ's evolution from private life to public life that we celebrate with the baptism by John and the baptism of the Holy Spirit by Jesus. At some time, we are moved as a faith community to really ask ourselves sometimes at the beginning of a year, why are we doing this? What can we do differently? And how is it going? In a general way, the real question is, why am I a Catholic? And why do I remain a Catholic? And I think all of us, whether or not we're formed in a community, a religious community, in our own community, or in our own families, have to somehow answer that question in a poignant way, and in these days, probably in a more forceful way than we may be used to. So at the end of this long formation period of nine years or so, we agree and we vow in front of all of you that we will continue to pledge that our lives be changed in an ongoing conversion. And I think it's a model that we articulate for all of us here, families, professionals, coworkers, our staff, so we articulate something and you help us understand how we're doing. And I think your family does and performs the same kind of function. This morning's readings provide three glimpses and three unique historical glimpses into three of the reasons that I think that I remain and am a Catholic and very happily so, a Norbertine. And those are truth, beauty, and goodness. The first reading from Isaiah insists that we are too little and it's too, too little and too much paucity to simply call us servants, but we are called heirs. So we know, learn early on in the Old Testament that God is a God who is interested in both equality and sharing wealth. There's no real division. It's funny how our own life sometimes matches up with the readings. In the past few weeks, I've spent all my afternoons in Bernalillo County Probate Court probating a will. And as I was leaving Thursday after many visits, the woman said, you forgot one thing. Because you are a trustee, you are also a devisee and an heir. And that changed everything for me. I thought, I'm an heir? That's really great to know. 
we have very few chances in our life to be named heir. And I guess there's a lot of anxiety around reading wills and am I the heir. But there's also this notion of heir apparent. Um, and we see that in sports, we see that in our society, in you know, our firms, in our jobs, the heir apparent, the person who's going to succeed. But we are invited basically to be part of a kingdom that is different than the kingdom anyone expected, certainly in the Old Testament and certainly in our day and age. It's a kingdom that's characterized by peace and a spirit of interiority. Paul's letter to the Corinthians at the start of that epistle speaks also of what it's like to be in the peace and kindness of the Lord. In the gospel, we find that water becomes a visible sign of identifying God's own beloved son, none of which was necessary. But it seems to me that the whole notion of our sacramental life is one of visibility. So Jesus appears as we often do here, and he notices John, and John notices him, and they get together and create this sacrament which really is the sacrament of visibility. We're visible icons in our community and in our faith communities of what we believe. When I go back to the considerations of why be Catholic and why remain Catholic, I think often of the notion of, of the importance of truth in what we do and what we represent there's a great chance that we are misguided. And millions of people before us are also misguided. If the things that we spoke of today and the readings that we proclaimed are not true, we could, by convention, just say today that to make us happy, that this really is heaven and we've been mistaken that this is earth and Abba Joel is God, and some of us would be happy that with that, and some of us would be like thinking, oh God, literally. <laughs> so, um, but it's important, I think, to understand for us in our, our faith journey that what we believe is true and to act on truths. There's a famous story of a pope who would not even agree to say one small lie, even if it meant he would get to heaven. And so at that very minuscule level, miniature level of our lives, are we honest? Are we honest to our spouses? Are we honest to our employers? Are we honest to God? Are we honest to our grandchildren? Are they honest to us? Don't answer that. And then the second aspect is beauty. I have the privilege of traveling all over the country to different places, principally because I live on the East Coast and my family is there. So I get to visit churches in New York and the tiny little village where my mom lives. But every church, no matter how simple and how poorly funded, has a place of rare beauty in it. At my mom's church in a place about 1,700 miles from here, there is a shrine to Kari Tekawitha. And that just amazes me that people know and want to celebrate kind of the beauty of our faith. The third aspect that I wanted to touch on is the aspect of goodness. There probably is no body and no institution that supplies as much goodness as our church does through our various ministries, through our outreach, through our presence, through our suggesting that's an alternative to the madness of consumption and of busyness to say that contemplation has a place and a rightful place in our life wherever we are. It's commented oftenly, often that you never win an argument with a saint. And that's part of the good tradition that we have in our faith that I evaluate in my own life this time of year. Mother Teresa was often visited by people of substantial means who wanted to assist in her in her mission. And on one occasion, a gentleman came forward and said, I agree with everything in the church except these two things. And she guessed what the two things were. And he said, one of them is, I don't understand the church's position on abortion. And she said, 
how can there be too many flowers in the world? How do you argue with those kinds of things? And we all try to be you know, good at argument. I didn't think I was going to get here this morning because I was arguing so much with Father Bob. But we all try to be, <laughs> to be right and to, to justify ourselves and figure out new clever things and then go to school and come back and argue differently. Um, but we never can really supersede the lives of the saints. And so those are three kind of reasons that I um, consider um, that my faith is alive and I'm kind of evaluating it now. And I wonder if you all ever do a performance evaluation on your own faith lives. I continue to be fascinated by the intentionality of our grounds here. Yesterday I, I spoke to Ken because I didn't know why the window panes were different sizes in each of the three transepts. And he patiently explained to me that he didn't know. No, he said, I, um, <laughs> I, I think it's because we wanted to let in a certain amount of light early in the day and more light as the sun rose. And that made sense to me in the context of my initial point of inclusion and, and gradual inclusion. We welcome light, not in an abundance and not all at once. We don't get our prayers answered immediately. None of the people we seem to pray for to recover from cancer ever seem to recover. But more light comes into our life. And I think that's an important piece of our faith life. I also think that as a church, we are going somewhere. We are not standing still. We sit in stillness in order to get to a destination. And I think that destination is salvation. In a quirky way, Jesus' baptism draws John, his baptizer, into a faith relationship with him that will cost him his head. If we're not correct in all these beliefs, then we must realize and admit that we are just really a bunch of fools. And we're fools of a relatively astounding magnitude if none of this stuff is true. But scholars and theologians have been at our side and at our elbow to help us prove over and over again that these things are true. That Jesus was baptized first by water, and then by the Holy Spirit, that Isaiah came to a people dispossessed and promised that they would be heirs. I'm always struck by the reasons people give uh, for no longer coming to church and no longer participating in our faith. And it always seems to focus on something that they've experienced and it's completely understandable. Um, I'm not sure it's sufficient to outweigh this tradition that we have in our own lives. Finally, there's no real place in our church for any level of requirement about perfectionism. We're not asked to be perfect. We're not asked to just show up. But somewhere in between those goalposts, we are asked to kind of participate in our faith and in revealing God's message to us. Pope Francis this just this week said, we don't have to wait till we're perfect to bear witness to Jesus. Our proclamation begins today, right where we live. And it does not begin by trying to convince others, but by witnessing every day to the beauty of the love that has looked down upon us and lifted us up. By way of praxis or best practices, you know, they send you away and you learn all these things and all these words. And then you come back and, and like looking at you, what is practice? We're going to begin to raise awareness about three or four different projects that um, are near and dear to some of us. And one of them is the Friends of the Children of El Salvador, which is a carryover from days at the Newman Center. So within the next couple of months, I'll be going to El Salvador and seeing what seeds that were sown many, many years ago by Donna and Jerry, how they've been brought to harvest. The second thing is there's going to be a growing awareness of our nuclear disarmament message that the Archbishop has been on the forefront of 
And so we're going to possibly do an offer set of study groups and kind of a um, experience that some of us had in just faith on this particular issue of how to speak about divisive issues. And then the third thing that's happening is on the first Tuesday of the month, we feed homeless people in conjunction with Second Presbyterian Church downtown. And um, we do that because um, it just seems to be gospel laden in some way. So with all this change you know, that is going on, it's fascinating to me to hold on to the things that seem not to change. Uh, and though the church seems not to change, I would beg to differ.